Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inspired Driving interview series. I am so incredibly grateful that my dear friend and amazing trainer all the way in South Africa, Yinku Dietrichsen, is here to chat with us. Welcome, Yinku. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to be here this beautiful morning. And uh, thank you so much. Welcome, America. <laughs> I'm really glad you're here and I have all sorts of questions. Do you want to share just like a, a tidbit of what you do and and what lights up for you in the horse world? Ooh, now that I'm going to try and keep it short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I am currently working on um, uh, membership sites as if that I call Yenku TV and the intention is to really help people to um, break things down into the smallest learnable steps because I find that a lot of people are finding it very hard to train and especially during COVID as like people were getting a bit lost as like, and they couldn't they didn't have access to their, their trainers and so it, it's been a very interesting journey for me as well but I'm very excited as like, uh, um, that it is possible that technology is actually enabling us to do this. And so I've been working on trying to make two minute videos and imagine me trying to make a two minute video of something that I've said in, in, in a whole hour time and edit that down to just two minutes. So uh, it's very challenging, but I'm very excited that it's coming along and I've also had to learn to animate. So all the experience over the last 30 years, um, I'm now able to, package it myself in a very logical and chronological order that um, I trust is really going to give people a roadmap so that they can really help themselves um, without necessarily having to depend on, on, a, on a trainer. The trainer will obviously add value, but I think it's quite important to, uh, to enable people so that they can do it themselves between themselves and their horse. And that um, a, a third party, if anything, will just enhance that experience. But um, in principle, the intention is for them to be able to do it on their own. That is fantastic. And I'm really impressed with that. And I really agree. It's so important to have those small moments of learning so you can learn and implement, learn and implement. And it's, it's wonderful to be able to do that. I've just finished a 12 week course that does exactly the same, but helps people get brave in the saddle. So once they've gone through that and they're ready to really get their training on, then your program should be ready. And it'll be a perfect match. So it's very exciting. Oh, I like that, that the <laughs> synergy. I think that's what it's about. And it is interesting yeah. people trying to build people's confidence. It's like, um, so yeah, uh, uh, especially in the Aussie world, it's like, it's not always friendly, eh? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing my best to change that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yes. fist bump, put it there, put it there. <laughs> Virtual fist bump. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay, you go. I'm going to ask you a really fun question. If I handed you 10 million US dollars right now, what would be the first thing yeah. you would do? Woo! Fly to you. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> 10 million. Actually, I could fly several times to you and back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we'll do is we'll buy what I call the ICANN bus because I actually heard that they have um, Airbus A380s and they're going quite inexpensive at the moment because they're on sale. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the 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 upper upper story um humans can fly there and the horses will fly downstairs and then we spend summertime in america and then we spend summertime in south africa because it's northern hemisphere southern hemisphere so we'll never have a winter oh that's brilliant i love that <laughs> yeah so i think that's what i'm going to spend my 10 million dollars on <laughs> how fun <laughs> it's on an i can bus <laughs> yes and i'll have my facility and you can have all your clinics there it would be brilliant so yes Woo! Now we're talking. Let's now we're this. talking. Let's do this. Yeah. We're speaking into existence. Yep. <laughs> abracadabra. Do you know what the word abracadabra means? I believe it is. And I and I speak it and it happens. Is that is that what it is? Yeah, you're close. I'm impressed. So most people say to me it's it's a magic spell. But in old Hebrew, it quite literally means I create what I speak. So, yeah, it's powerful, eh? Very powerful words. Very. Abracadabra. So you said it, I said abracadabra, so it's going to happen. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, my goodness. Um, 
So I'd love to hear a little bit about your history, like how you got started in writing and what that experience was like for you. Oh, okay. So that's way back. When I was seven years old, uh, we used to go to my grand uh, in a different part of South Africa. It's called the Free State. It was called the Free State then. So it was um, about three or 400 kilometers from where we lived. We lived in, in a, a medium-sized town. And so every second Friday, we would go in the car and travel to her and go and spend the weekend there on the farm. And on the way there, we had a picnic um, and this donkey walked up to us and I said to my dad, I want to ride this donkey. My dad says, how do you know that it, that whether it's tame or not? And I go, surely if it's so friendly and it walks up to us, it's rideable. So I said, can I hop on it? He said, ah, I'm not so sure if that's a clever idea. So he popped me on and he stood back. And in those days, there were no cell phones or uh, digital cameras. It was still film. And he stood back and he took a photograph of me riding this donkey with nothing on, no saddle, no bridle, nothing. Oh. And so the donkey walked calmly for about five or 10 steps. And the next thing it bucked me off into a barbed wire fence. <laughs> and so I was hooked for life. <laughs> That's how I got into riding horses. <laughs> so did they find like, someone to give you lessons or? So then the other interesting thing is my, my cousin lives in the same province, it's like, but a different on the opposite side. And so we used to live in Namibia um, after that. We, we lived in Namibia for about seven years and we would come and visit once a year, come and visit all our family, like a road trip almost. And so I used to ride with him once a year and we would go, it's quite a long ride. They've got a big uh, 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 maize farm. And I, uh, we would go all the way to the river. And then when the horses turned around and they started going home, they actually just bolted. So, so initially I tried to hold the horse back and he said to me, don't do that. The horse is going to rear, let go of the reins. So I would hold on to the, the saddle and the mane and scream for two and a half kilometers. And this horse just bolted home with me. And I knew that it would stop when it gets home. So I just knew I had to stay on until I got home. So I didn't actually have any lessons until I joined the South African Mounted Police in 1990. I never had, I, I was I able to stay on. That's amazing. <laughs> well, I'm glad it didn't keep you from riding. <laughs> so. No, I think I'm way, when, when it's weird, it's like in South Africa, we have something that we call horse sickness. Now, you can, you can inoculate for, for horses against it, but you can't inoculate humans against it because there's no injection that works for humans <laughs> when they have horse sickness, eh? It's funny, I was exactly thinking, we call it being bitten by the bug, but instead of being bitten, I believe you and I were attacked by the bug. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, we have it. It's like zombie nation. <laughs> yes. There's no going back ever. And that's totally no, funny. <laughs> not. There's no cure for what we have. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, if you don't mind, I'd love to go into some of the questions that my group members in the Inspired Riding Connection asked. Um, one You're of them, I'll, I'll start out with Jana. Jana asked a really cool question. She said, What's one thing you feel every horse owner or rider ought to learn and utilize daily with their horses? Sure. Okay. Wow. Thank you for that lovely question, uh, Jana. It's like I, I would venture to say, so, so just from, from my own point of view, there's one thing that I've developed, and it comes from learning theory, but I um, have have, I think, made it more simple and more accessible, and I call it the three agreements. And the three agreements is literally a clear way of communicating, yes, this is what I want for desired behavior. And then the second agreement is a clear way of communicating, no, this is not what I want for an undesired behavior. And then the third agreement is a clear way of, uh, if in doubt, just go to neutral. So whether the horse and or the rider becomes anxious, is just go to neutral, relax, and, and let's just reset, and then we can try again. So um, at, 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 at the core of what I do, that is, that is whether we're working with a one-day-old foal or a Grand Prix-level horse, um, I'm using those three agreements and everything that I do with the horses. And I've actually come to call it one common language because uh, whether I work uh, with show jumpers or race horses and starting stalls or dressage horses doing in hand or under saddle, the off passage, canter pirouette, I, fundamentally those three agreements is the entire 
language without words is based or the one common language is based on those three agreements so i it's become a, a, a part of of just what we do is it's like us speaking in english you say we 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 are able to communicate because we both speak english imagine if you were speaking a french and i was only speaking afrikaans we wouldn't be able to communicate to each other or with each other it's like so it's such a nice thing to have the ability to in a very simple way give direct and accurate feedback yes or no is this what you want or is this what you want and um i i I think, um, yeah, so definitely as, as far as really going down to, to the core of, of it, um, that's, that's, that's what I do every day, all day, every five to 12 seconds, I'm either saying yes or no, or neutral. <laughs> Love that. And that's very similar to what I tell my clients. Clarity equals kindness. Oh, that's deep. I love it. It's really nice. Yo. Yeah. And so you are doing that with your horses by creating that clear yes the clear no or if we're not sure we just wait it out <laughs> right yeah. isn't that beautiful <laughs> clarity creates kindness yes or, okay. and that's for human that's horses, you know yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah because a lot of it's so interesting when when you get really strict instructors that speak with the voice of god and think that it is a very militant way in which we should teach um that uh, they there's a beautiful, to, to go a little bit off topic, there's a beautiful presupposition in neurolinguistic programming that says the quality of your communication is in the response that you get. So that's one. And then the other one is uh, there's no such thing as an untrainable student, only inflexible teacher. So it puts the onus right back on the teacher to say, if someone doesn't understand, raising your tone of voice and speaking with the voice of God and then trying to be all militant, it's not going to help them at all because you're actually not helping them. You are making them even more anxious when you do that. So, so if, if you start seeing someone getting worried and anxious, it, the onus is on you to, to take it take it back um, and uh, deconstruct and try and explain in a different way until they get it. Yes. And that's actually a, a lot of how I, when you're getting into that neutral place, when you're not sure what to do, that's where you, I put on the new cap, get curious, be appreciative of the moment and then be playful, you know, C-A-P. Oh, wow. So, I love your language. It's so <laughs> nice that you talk, you like we talk about uh, um, at the core of the same thing, but at, uh, yeah. like uh, how it's possible to explain it in different words. Is like at the core, it's, it, it, like it, it's technical, like opening up a, a motherboard of a computer. But like it, when you look at a Mac, I'm an I'm a Apple fan. A Mac is very user friendly. You can literally just take it out of the box and work with it. You don't have to upload fancy software and you don't have to worry that anything is going to clash it like they talk to each other. <laughs> totally. And that's what I love about it. And it, everything at the core is very similar. And, it, and it's just like what you're saying. If the student doesn't understand, it's your job to get really creative. And that's one of my favorite things about teaching. I'm like, okay, that didn't work. How about this? How about this? How about this? And you wait till the light bulb comes off on and it's just, it's a beautiful thing. Um, it is beautiful. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> it's very special because to me, what really excites me is that 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 horse human connection, and every human and every horse is unique, and therefore the connection is unique. Yes. So people often say to me, "You're training nine horses in a row. You're doing fundamentally the same thing. So we're doing uh, hock flexions for, let's say, Piaf, and we do static le leg extensions for Spanish walk and passage, and we're doing." Um, neutral, neutral feet. So stand still, put your head down. And see, uh, the one, one of my clients said, I saw you this morning when you first started training the first two lessons, then she had to go off um, and work. And then she came back. Her lesson was the last one for the day. She said, you have just done nine hours of doing pretty much the same thing. Don't you get bored? And I go, no, never, ever. It is fascinating to see this horse brain and this human brain. And it's never the same. Exactly. Exactly. That's the most fun thing about it it's never boring <laughs> it's never boring exactly <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness okay let me get to oh i think emma is watching right now her question how do you work with horses that get irritated irritated or annoyed um when you're asking for something Ooh, is it emma that asked this question uh, m e m uh -huh. EM. Oh, I like that name. That's quite nice. M. M. So James Bond like worked for, with M as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your question, M. It's like, so 
uh, uh, interesting thing, just to give you a little bit of a backstory, just how I, I think about it. Obviously, when the brain is making new connections, that uh, um, can be frustrating. So it's uh, obviously what we're trying to do is limit the frustration or the anxiety levels as much as what we possibly can, possibly can. But if the brain is doing something that is new and different, it has to obviously make new connections and that um, burns calories. So at a very fundamental level, a human brain um, weighs 2% of our body weight and a horse's brain weighs 1.2% of their body weight and yet it uses 20% of the calories that we eat. So that's really interesting to know. Um, and, cool and so, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So that is very interesting to know. And, and so the brain, whether it's a human brain or a horse's brain, is actually asking, what's in it for me? Why, why should I make new connections? I'm going to be burning uh, some calories here. And so in a way, it, it starts going into a bit of a scarcity mindset. It's like, why? why I'm going to burn some resources here. And I don't think that's such a clever idea. So, um, and so when we, when we work with incentive-based training, we are constantly topping up those calories, if you think of it. Yes. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so, so the brain starts relaxing. So we're keeping a little bit, we're keeping it out of that, that uh, survival state, because obviously we're not talking about flight state. We just talk about, hey, I'm going to start burning calories here, and I, where am I going to get new calories from? It's like, so we're starting to go to, to where we... Uh, not necessarily in flight state, but we're challenging the horse's survival state. And, and so um, horses, of course, if you're asking them something that's a little bit harder and they're not used to it, they can get frustrated and, and they sometimes headbutt or they push or um, they start moving around, they start moving their feet around. And so one of the fundamental exercises that I do is I train the horses to stand on a rubber car mat. So in South Africa, we have a rectangular mat that's got tiny little squares on it. And I actually spray painted bright green so that it looks different than the rest of the, the environment. So the horses know visually, if you go and you stand on that mat, you're gonna get lots of rewards. So I call that neutral feet. And so that's the physical side of it. But then obviously at a mental level, once we have the horse standing on the mat and they start recognizing, uh, Every time I put both my feet on this pressure pad, the M&M &M starts popping out of my human vending machine. They'll be that much more inclined to want to go and stand on the mat with both front feet. And then uh, at a deeper level, there, uh, once we can do the physical thing, then we start going uh, more mental where we go, thank you for standing still. Can I also now try and help you to find a place of relaxation? And so that is basically my default behavior that I establish first and foremost before I start challenging the horses and asking them for more complex behavior. It, it works really well because we then at least have a reset button. And so in a way that is training the horse, the third agreement that the horse, so training the answer before we actually ask the question. So um, you all, if you don't know what to do, go and stand on the green mat. The M&M &M starts popping out of the human. And M&M &M, M &M is actually an acronym for mark and motivate. So we used to oh, talk about that. click and reward. <laughs> <laughs> mark click and, and reward, me. but the, the serious clicker trainers are going, oh, you are not a, a really a clicker trainer because I'm a little bit of a lot of things. So I, I, I used to do natural horsemanship and then I got into clicker training and then I got into classical dressage. So the purist will say to me, you're not really doing natural horsemanship um, because you're rewarding. The clicker trainers are saying, you're not really doing clicker training because you're using pressure and release. The classical dressage riders are saying, you're using pressure and release and you're using rewards. And so therefore it's not classically correct. And so I go, ah, ah, and they make it really hard. So um, we just said, well, in the end, it's about um, trying to help horses and humans. That's, that's the bottom line. And if we can make it the, the process easier and less stressful um, and we can keep the anxiety levels as low as what we can then we must be doing a good thing i love that and i like to call it the magic carpet like you were there <laughs> magic happens and and it's it works so well really because i only did a few training sessions with pepper and then he'll wander wander over to it and and step on it and go okay where are my treats 
<laughs> oh, wow. But you know what? So you've even given that another name because I actually call it Mutual Mat. I love Magic Carpet. That's really cool. Thank you. And that's actually what I had thought of uh, before I even knew about these concepts. I was working with a pony mare that just wouldn't stay still. I had to cold hose her every day because she had hurt her leg. And so I yeah. gave her the image. I'm like, this, this mat where you need to be hosed off is a magic carpet. If you step off of it, you're going to fly off because we're in the air and we're flying and you want to stay safe. Uh, so that was the image I gave her. So when you said yeah. that, I'm going, oh, it's my magic carpet idea, but you're making it so much more accessible and, and clear. So I love that. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. I love your magic carpet. Like, that's really nice. It's got a very nice connotation because I'm a Aladdin fan as well, eh? Good. <laughs> Robin Williams, Aladdin. <laughs> oh, gosh. Such a wonderful film. Oh, man. We've watched that yeah. so many times. Um, oh. Cool. Okay, let's get to another question. This so, one. Sunshine in California, she would love to know how to transition from riding in safe spaces like a round pen to areas without fencing that can be a little intimidating. Did I hear correctly? Your name is Sunshine from California. Yes, sir. Yes! <laughs> and you are from California. Okay, so that's an interesting question. Normally I say good quality questions get good quality answers. If you, uh, uh, and, and so this this another one of my sayings, Rather be on the ground wishing that you were on your horse's back than be on your horse's back wishing that you were on the ground. So obviously, if you're able to ride in the round pen and that's working really well for you and your horse is confident there and you are confident um, in the round pen, that is, is really nice. So it already means that you are able to. So that that's very good to, to know that you can ride on your horse and not go, I'm so afraid I don't want to even get on my horse. So what I normally do is if we up the criteria and we want to now start going into, a, let's say, a bigger arena before we actually go um, on an outride, what I normally do is I would go on the ground, so ride the horse in the round pen, and then go on the ground. And I think you guys call it a, a 10 foot or a 12 foot rope. It's like we call it in meters. It's like, so it's a four, I like a four and a half meter rope, but um which is a little bit longer. It's about 14 or 15 feet as far as I know, okay. because I work with really big warm blood. So sure. um, it just makes the circle a little bit bigger and the horse is able to stay in a better balance. Uh, if you're working with a horse, it's a little bit more like a quarter horse size than a, I think it's a 12 foot is a nice length, but you want to take that rope. You definitely don't want to wear gloves and you're going to start walking around your your property and, and you want to start showing your horse um, some places so so like let's call them milestones so you go to a specific object and you go to the object and you go and you stand there like i just explained with the mat and and you find relaxation and then you pick your next milestone and then you start walking to that milestone and if you get there you want to help yours to find relaxation so so basically let's say your stations or your milestones are initially 20 meters apart Every time you start moving, the horse becomes a little bit aroused and you start going, oh, the horse is starting to look around and I'm not so sure. But then you get to your next milestone and we stop the feet and then we start moving the mouse. So what we're doing is we're taking the blood away from the muscles and we bring the blood back to the intestines for rest and digest. So fundamentally, the horse, when they start moving their feet, not really, but think as if they're going into towards fight or flight state and then before they go full on fight or flight we go go back to neutral relax and then we move to the next one again and so slowly you are able to start stretching those distances or you start skipping so let's say they were 20 meters apart instead of going every 20 meters stop stand relax we start going 40 meters so we skip the the in-between one so instead of going from a b c d you start skipping you go from a to c and you skip b and you stop stand relax get the blood bait away from the muscles back to the intestine and so you're creating an environment where you start having an, the opportunity where you can actually check your horse out where you're safe on the ground and you see how your horse responds and you're going to start seeing your horse is going into this calm relaxed state and when you walk they don't even come up and start looking around like this they just walk calmly to the next one and to the next one and so that small little world that is a 20 meter round pin is starting to become in concentric circles, becoming a 40 meter and then a, 
a 60 meter and an 80 meter and a 100 meter circle and eventually it's a 200 and a 400 and an 800 meter circle so you just want to play with that and make your horses world bigger but in a safe way and you'll know you'll know when your horse is calm and relaxed that you say oh, i think i can ride and then when you do get on in the round pen let's say the gates open you've guys got nice gates you can open it off the horse's back but you ride and you go out of the round pen you go you never want to go all the way to the edge of your horse's comfort zone so let's say it was was 800 meters away from the round pen you want to go 400 meters away from the round pen and then yours and your reward is to turn around go back to the round pen and then dismount and the horse goes what i thought we were going to go all the way to the edge of my comfort zone plus four percent we go no we're going to play it easy i want you to go into i can state of mind and i want your horse to go into i can state of mind so on the ground obviously we can explore and go and make that that comfort zone really big so let's say it's a kilometer eventually i don't know if you're talking miles I do, but some, some other people on this group talk in kilometers, so you talk however you want. <laughs> so it's one, I think a mile is 1,2 kilometers. It's like, so, so let's say you go a mile. A mile is really big. It's, it's quite a big circle right. around your round pen. So you don't want to go all the way to a mile. You go 600 meters, yes. half a mile, and then you turn back. And the horse goes, but I was able to go all the way over there. You go, no, you don't have to go. So yep. slowly you build your horse's confidence and your own confidence. And, and then one other thing is if you do ride out and your horse starts getting nervous, we used to be taught you, you need to stay on the horse. Otherwise, they're going to learn a bad habit. But my wife, Catherine, was quite a nervous rider when I met her. So she wanted to do all the nice stuff, but she was nervous. And so she, she got off the horse. So to give you a tip, what Catherine did is she would tie because we were riding in, in rope halters. So we did bitless riding huh? and with reins. But what she did is she would tie her 12 foot rope or 15 foot rope, um, coil it, and then tie it with a shoelace onto the deering of her English saddle. Okay. And so if, if I all started getting a little bit up on his toes because she was riding an Arab gelding, um, if he started getting a little bit like this, she on would that. immediately. <laughs> Yeah, so you yeah. immediately dismount and just help him neutral feet, put your head down, stand and relax. So she didn't try and ride him through the problem. She got off and when he settled down, she would just get back on and then we'd carry on riding because we were living um, on a farm in between a whole bunch of other farms. So we had access so we could literally ride through a farm, through a river and go to friends of ours on the other side of the river, which oh, was amazing. Wonderful. But she had that I. It, and, and so I, I learned that from Catherine. Catherine just said, I, I don't ride well enough to sit the bucks or the spins. So as soon as all started looking, getting a little bit lucky, she got off. And, and I, eventually she was able to ride him next to a mare, um, next to other horses, and he wouldn't even flick an ear. He would just walk like this. Okay. So it was fascinating to see it. Definitely it comes right. They just need time. What we tend to do is we tend to say, you, you, you mustn't jump around. And then we contain them between the bit and the reins and our legs, which makes them feel claustrophobic, which increases their stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. And so it's really interesting catch 22. So if you actually allow the horse to have a little bit of wiggle room, they actually relax. And when they're relaxed, then of course you want to sit on their back and ride. I love that. And this is such beautiful advice, you guys. Uh, I like to think of it as surprise your horse with a shorter session. Like they say, oh, but I could do more for you. I'm like, yes, but we don't have to. And then the next session will actually be even better for you. And that's how I train a lot of younger horses and a lot of uh, riders that need to build up confidence slowly. So I'm so glad you said that. That was a beautiful answer. And I love that your wife said, nope, I'm just going to hop off. And that's something I, I advocate all the time. You're, you're not acting like the horse is going to win. That, that's just nonsense to me. You know, you want to create a win for both of you, because if you're not able to handle it, you're not helping your horse. So you might as well hop off and find that neutral place. So I absolutely love that. So thank you for sharing that. Lovely. It's, it's so interesting <laughs> for me, Beth, is like to hear... <laughs> Because um, we, we, we speak on a uh, year and there, but to, to, to hear how similar it is, isn't it fascinating yeah. that there's this universal, I think it's called universal consciousness. I think so. There it might is. be yep. another word for it. But we, we're tapping into, into the ether and, yeah. and we're downloading 
similar information. We might label it like slightly different, but as, again, it, it comes. It's such. It's mind blowing to think how, how many concepts we share, and and it's not as if we've been talking about this. So I find it mind blowing. This is really that. cool. <laughs> well, I don't know if you know. You've heard my um, my meditation on plucking the string within the. Uh, fairy dust meditation, but principally the idea is all of us are beings of light, and you can think of it as a string of light, and the strings are all connected to the universal web. So we're all connected, we could all tap into the energy of the universe and be asked to be presented with the string that we want to connect with. So right now our strings are like having a nice little orchestrated dance, you know. <laughs> oh, and I'm thinking, as you say, it's like of the avatar, it's like that, yeah. like all those Oh, yes, that oh, it's one of my favorite movies. Right? It's like, yeah, yeah, it's like, woo, yeah, I'm there, I'm there. <laughs> so that, that's pretty much my theory, and I'm sticking to it. So <laughs> I like your theory. I don't think it's a theory. I think there's, there's reality in it, but um, obviously, because we can't actually physically see it, we, uh, people only believe what they see. Right. And then so that's yeah, quite it's an interesting thing. <laughs> Yeah, I have way so more fun really imagining. Nice. Yes, <laughs> very nice that you have such strong visuals because I think that makes it more real, more tangible, more Absolutely. visual. Absolutely, and to me, it's so much more fun to think about limitless possibilities. So, oh, yeah. Oh, that's deep. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, I have more questions for you. Let's see. What's something? that you've learned lately uh, that has been new to you and surprised you? Sure. Uh, that, that you are really switched on. I like that very much. <laughs> Even more so than I've, I've always known. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I think something that, that, that I, uh, it keeps getting reaffirmed is that that horses are actually very very intelligent animals but we tend to um not relate to them because they have monocular vision so when we talk about structure function as like they their eyes are set on the side of their face therefore they have lateral lateral thinking and because our eyes are set in the front of our face and so uh, it is with dogs as well we have direct line thinking. And so it's not that horses are less intelligent than dogs. They just have a different intelligence. And so we tend to not necessarily always appreciate the intelligence and uh, because it's not like us. Uh, they don't think like us. They think different. And, and I keep, I, it's, it's almost like there's like, Shrek says, uh, or not Shrek, the donkey and, and Shrek says, onions are like, uh, have, uh, or, or, or donkeys are like onions and they have layers or something like that. Right, right. So, <laughs> yeah, so I, I find it fascinating to see every time I, I think I'm starting to understand there's another layer of, of intelligence that we are tapping into. And I have a... a, a, a one of the chapters in my book, um, we, I talk about training horses from the inside out using communication rather than training horses from the outside in using manipulation. Right. And, and the more I play with it, the more I realize you don't actually have to even put a bit in the horse's mouth um, to be able to connect with their front feet and their back feet and their pelvis and their shoulders through the six connections and train them to do some fascinating things. And I think um, what is really nice for me is I am now able to explain it in very simple terms to other people, whereas before I think it, it was quite esoteric to, right. to ride a horse with nothing on. It's very esoteric and, and it's starting to become more and more something that I see it becoming more mainstream instead of the alternative. People are starting to go, uh, if you think about it, at some stage, there were no cell phones. And, and how did we even survive without it? It's like, and now, if you don't have a smartphone, it's like, under what rock have you been living? So that's like the, the attitude towards it. And, and so it's fascinating to see how technology has evolved in a matter of, let's say, 20 years. I don't know the exact number because I think there's been a progression. But in the way that we think and relate to horses, um, it's definitely 
uh, evolving really, really fast. Yes. Um, suddenly it feels as if it's picking up momentum, whereas initially it was really slow, maybe because of the internet. So before we had to study books, you had to go to someone physically to learn something, whereas I think we are rapidly able to share information with each it's other, our ways of thinking. Yes. Yeah, and I think that as a result, it's evolving really fast. So I just think that horses are super clever and, 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 and I keep um, being amazed by it. And, and it, like every time I go, okay, I think I've got it now. And then it, like the next layer opens up and it's like, I, I go, wow, <laughs> this is amazing. I still don't get it. I think I have to go back and learn some more. And then uh, like I start immersing myself and then I get to a place where I think, I think I understand it now. And then whoosh, another layer opens up again. That's what's so amazing. It is like an onion. You keep getting through layers. I had one young student, it was quite cute. She said, it's like when I ride, I'm playing a video game. And when I get better, I get to the next level. <laughs> oh isn't that a nice analogy exactly yeah, exactly yeah. like that yes. yeah it's like the, the doors key uh, start that they open or you get the key under the rock or the sword behind the stone and then you that opens up an, uh, the, a new yeah exactly like that the so, funny thing for me or the fascinating thing for me uh, sorry to interrupt you okay. is is that um, uh, the smaller the toolbox the bigger the skill so it, it's really interesting to see i used to have bags full of equipment when I was young and now I have one tiny little backpack that literally has a long rope a short rope rope reins a rope halter a reward bag gloves for to prevent rope burn and to not get frostbitten and uh, it's got a rubber snaffle in it that's it there's nothing else in that bag. Oh, and some some nice energy bars. <laughs> that's good. That's good. We need to give you you the treats too. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, so it's such an interesting thing to to really think, focus more on on communication, and and less on manipulation, and and really explore that. Um, and its fullness and so yeah the toolbox is definitely getting smaller and smaller so one of these days i'm going to even try and leave the bag at home and go with nothing <laughs> less, less is more right <laughs> exactly yeah exactly so da vinci and steve jobs used to say simplicity is the ultimate sophistication yes i love that so coming back to that you were talking about clarity and doing less um, and how clever horses are something my clients and I have been doing a lot more of is saying out loud exactly what we'd like the horse to do as like an invitation and when we yeah. say it out loud it also helps us create the image because you know the horse is thinking pictures so yeah. when we use our words then we use our images in our minds from our hearts and send that idea to them and then our body language Packs it, uh, backs it up, then it's like this three-way communication of inviting them to do something. And then if they don't understand, being okay with it and not pressuring them more. So I think it's so cool though, the more I've been speaking, especially uh, with just a real basic thing when I do blanketing for Pepper and Indy, Pepper is very pushy and he, he loves to push Indy and he, you know, cause he's the boss. And so what I had to do is I would turn to Pepper and say, Pepper, I need to put on Indy's blanket safely. You need to stand there. And he just went, oh. And he just wow. stood there. And I was like, that's, that's all I needed to do. I didn't have to get upset. I didn't have to shake my yeah. hands at him. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was <laughs> like, like ah! oh, okay. And he just stood there and waited. And then after I said, okay, now you can have your treats. Thank you very much. It was amazing. Oh, was so really I just wanted to share that, you know, just by speaking out loud clearly, again, abracadabra, ta-da. Yeah, it's <laughs> <We did>. it. <laughs> <laughs> that it is back. special. Oh, yes. wow. Interesting thing that I um, have seen race car drivers do as well is they literally, so this may be a little bit more a digital way to think about it, um, is that we they use their language brain to tell their limbic brain, which is a feeling brain, uh, how to drive. So they'll go touch the brake, gear down apex 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 so they look where they're going and they're talking they themselves out of 
Yeah, so they, nice. they literally, their language brain is telling their limbic brain where, where our habits are formed and um, new behaviors are learned. They're literally telling their, their limbic brain what actions they want it to do so that the next time they come to the same corner or same bend in the road, they, they don't tell the limbic brain, you stuffed it up, you're so useless, you should have braked a little bit softer and not pulled the steering wheel so hard. They actually tell their brain what to do next time when they go through the same turn so to good. improve. Yes. Yeah, but I love yeah. the way that you speak it. Thank you. And I, I love that story. And that really goes into the idea that your mind needs to hear what you actually want to create. So when you actually speak it into existence, then your mind can create those neural pathways. So you might as well tell it good things. <laughs> exactly. Ah, so I like, I like to focus on the 20% that's working and, and maybe just explain where I got the math from. If you think about the invisible box of your bit and then your rain on the right, I don't know, to you it might be your left, your left, your rain on the, on the right and your legs create a rectangle around your horse. It is something from a bird's eye view, something that your horse can feel, but they cannot see it. And so um, it is such an interesting thing because that makes the horse obviously feel claustrophobic and that increases their cortisol levels. So if one has a clear picture in your mind of what it is that you want, and, and, and there are these full invisible walls around the horse, fundamentally, if your horse walks forward, if you're trying to get them to stand still, you are gonna say no, every time it bumps into pressures feedback no it's not forward no it's not back no it's not to the left no it's not to the right yes it's neutral so four out of five times we fundamentally say no 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 and only one out of five times we're saying yes so i often will ask clients if i said to you no that's not good enough 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 would you want to have a lesson with me and they go no that's terrible and i go that's why we focus on the 20% that the horse is trying to do right. And we incentivize them for it instead of focusing on what they're doing wrong because you get sucked into that 80% really quickly. And before you know it, you're constantly giving negative feedback. And so it's really important to focus on the 20% that your horse is trying to do right and point that out. Well done for trying instead of saying, no, it wasn't good enough. Absolutely. And that's what I strive to do too. So I'm really glad you said that. Um, I had a random question pop in my mind because it's something that I've done naturally and I know it helps to calm the horse. I wonder if you know anything about the science of it, but especially with thoroughbreds, I find figure eights and lots of changes of direction seem to help uh -huh. them come back to a neutral calm space. Do you, do you know anything okay. about that or, or why that is? So I'm going to give you my take on it. I've, I've spoken to a, a professor before and I explained the autonomic nervous system and he listened, he heard, he heard me out. And afterwards he said to me, um, it's not quite how I would have explained the autonomic nervous system, but the more important thing is does it work the way that you explain it to your clients? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, in that case, keep doing it. He says, because as we research the brain, we realize how little we actually understand it because uh, let's say MRI machine, for instance, before that MRI, they only had x-rays. So they, they came to certain conclusions based on x-rays. And then now that they have MRI and even more advanced technology, and they can, I think it's called EKG, they start realizing, but the brain is firing because we used to believe that, that we only use 7% of our brain capacity. And that's not necessarily true. At any given time, you're using 7%, but it's that 7% moves around. So let's say in peak hour traffic, there's, there's lots of cars on the road and that's 7% activity is on the road. And then everyone is at work and now the 7% is in tall buildings. And then when they go home, it's like then you at night, the 7% the is in the suburbs. So the activity moves around your brain. So your whole brain cannot be active all at once because then I'm sure you could you would be able to um, jump from, from this universe to another one. But, Did you ever um, see the movie Lucy? Uh, I, I, uh, with Morgan the Freeman, main actress? Morgan Freeman and Scarlett Johansson. I think I have, must have. What's it, it about? It had to do with her getting her brain on all the way up to 100. 
Oh, yes, I have. It's That's intense. mind blowing. Yeah. yeah, if anybody, literally, if anyone wants to watch it, it's it's very intense. It's a Baz Luhrmann film, and I love all of his women um, roles. Anyway, sorry, wow. I interrupted so, you. No, no, that's, that's cool. It's, 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 it's a little bit of like we're going there in the brain. So, so yeah. now to get back a little bit to yes. my interpretation. For one, when we do figures of eight, is a, um, then this is a nice one to remember. Flexibility increases relaxation and relaxation increases flexibility. So fundamentally, when the horse's body is bending this way, the, the right half in your eyes would be the left half of the body has to uncontract. So fundamentally, this side goes parasympathetic, this side goes sympathetic. So the contracted side is contracting and going sympathetic, this goes parasympathetic. And so the brain is getting challenged because half of it is, is, is contracting and half is uncontracting. And so that's a fascinating thing when you ask an horse to bend. So a good example of it. That makes if sense. You have to stand, yeah, next to, next to a horse and you ask them to do a carrot stretch. If there's no halter on them and you literally just offer them the carrot, they, they bend really easy and they just come and fetch the carrot. The moment you try and pull on the rein that's attached to the bit, you, go, you get opposition reflex and the horse goes into the pressure. So it's, it's interesting it's like to, to get relaxation first. So I, I talk about learning in three stages. Initially at stage one, we literally just use reward as feedback, no reward as feedback, no pressure. So the horse can come and carry a stretch and they come really easy. So we train the answer first, bend your neck, have the reward. Well done, easy. Phase two of learning, we start saying, I'm going to hold on to the lead. So I'm not going to try and pull you. I'm just going to hold. So if you turn your head a little bit away from me, you're going to get precious feedback on the side of your face. But when you turn your head towards me, there will obviously be a release of feedback and a reward as feedback. So that's like a hybrid method between the pressure and release method and the reward, no reward method. And so that's where I operate. And then phase three, which is very much the conventional way of, of uh, training, is we use pressure as feedback and release as feedback. It's still a binary language, but we're basically saying no when the horse gets something, when, when they get it wrong, pressure as feedback. But then when they get it right, we're not rewarding them. We just release this feedback to communicate, yes, this is what I want. But it's not really a clear yes, it's just a, a neutral. And so it's really interesting that people fundamentally skip those first two stages and they just want to go straight to phase three without actually training the answer before they ask the question. And so that's why we build a lot of anticipatory anxiety into horses unintentionally. So coming back to the bending, the bending definitely, um, flexibility increases relaxation, relaxation increases flexibility. Also what happens is if you're doing it on a figure of eight, you are fundamentally changing brain hemispheres. So let's say you're circling left and, and you are lunging for argument's sake or leading the horse. And, and so the horse sees you on the left-hand side. When we change rein and we're lunging, we're going to be on the right-hand side of the horse's brain. So a horse's brain is contralateral, same as a human. So the right brain hemisphere regulates everything that happens on the left half of the horse's body. The left brain hemisphere regulates everything that happens on the right half of the horse's body. So what's really nice about lunging and leading the horse is you cannot be on both sides of the horse at the same time. So if you compare it to juggling, it's literally throwing the ball up and down in, in your right hand. And when you get that really good, you switch and you put it in the other hand and now you practice the other hand. But if we are sitting on the horse's back and we try and do both sides simultaneously, that's starting to pass the ball from this hand to that hand. And if the horse doesn't have the coordination and in the individual brain hemisphere and the other, so one half, other half, and we start saying, now look at me with both eyes, concentrate um, on my legs and my hands on both sides of you at, at the same time, the horse literally goes into overwhelm. And so another way to think of it is, I often ask people, have you ever tried to brush your teeth with your left hand if you are right-handed? People go, no. Why would I want to do that? And I go, for dexterity's sake. So imagine trying to brush your teeth with both hands simultaneously. That's how, how challenging it is for a horse when we sit on their back because in their mind, there's, there's two people sitting on their back. There's a, a person on their left, which is normally their more confident side because they get handled a lot more on the left-hand side. So they say, oh, wow, where's my friend on the left-hand side? You're so nice. But the bet on the right-hand side is more no. corporate, more serious. And they go, this one, 
that looks just like that one, she's a lot more scary than that one. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's really interesting um, when we're on both sides of the horse. Um, I definitely think that they they go into overwhelm. So to to break it down, deconstruct it, and make it simpler, it's really useful to work one side and then work the other side, especially the right-hand side, because we need to catch up, brushing with a not-so-confident hand. And then when that's equally confident, then when we get on, we have a very different horse underneath us. Love that. And it also reminds you to build your empathetic em empathy button because when the horse is going on the side that's harder for them, instead of us getting frustrated, we can go, hey, would you be riding with the non-dominant hand just as beautifully? Like you've got to turn into their cheer cheerleader instead of, you know, being frustrated with them. So I think it's really important to make that shift. And I love the reminder that suppleness and flexibility brings you back to relaxation and that makes total sense uh, i loved how you explained the figure eight so thank you for that my pleasure thank you for that such a nice quality question <laughs> thank you it was something that was on my mind um also going back to my esoteric learning there's some how uh, uh, words got all jumbled because that happened sorry <laughs> tom oh. Ken tom kenyon is a sound healing um channeler from entity is called the Hathors. And I have this book and he talks about imagining a figure eight within your brain and it'll help calm you. And it made me thinking about the figure eight with the horses. And I'll often do that just on Zoom, like just thinking about figure eights and infinity symbols and how we're all connected. And you yeah. know, this is how my mind works. So I just That's thought it was really fun to play with. And now I like that. So another <laughs> thing is uh, the corpus callosum is under the, the little bridge between the two brain hemispheres underdeveloped in horses and in men. That's why we cannot multitask. Did you know that? So interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> but there was another a video talking about how men function in boxes and they have a box for everything. And you have to like tap them on the shoulder and say, are you okay to come out of this box to talk about this box? <laughs> Whereas the women were all wired for everything. We're all connected. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah. a female brain literally has lots more um, <laughs> connections between the two brain hemispheres. And I'm now thinking as you talk about that um, infinity sign, yes. uh, uh, when you think in that figure of eight pattern, you basically keep switching from one side to the other side, but can you see how the information is passing through the corpus callosum, the bridge, and then going to this side of the brain, and then it comes back and it comes through the bridge and it comes to this side. So I'm wondering- Turning it all we, on, you know? Yeah, so when, when I work horses over uh, 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 for water jumps especially, oh, what yeah. I normally do is I put two tops on the ground, but I make a gap in the middle. So, okay. so I'm sending the horse on, on my rope, on my long, my my 15 foot horse handling rope, I send it through the gap and then I turn them, I bring them to me initially to reward them. Well done for going through the gap because this is the most scary part to go through this gap. When they come through the gap, they turn, I reward them. And then as they stand, I ask them, go through the gap this way. So we keep changing eyes and we keep changing sides. And then the horse comes through the gap again, through the gap, turn, Come for your reward. Go this way. Can you see your infinity oh, yeah. sign? Oh, yeah. That's awesome. I yeah. love it. Yeah. That's a, that's a so great I'm tip. A... I might play with that um, when it comes time to doing more water stuff. I love it. Uh, Absolutely. It's like, so you can do it with anything. You can do it with, and, and I don't know if you, you, you call it a, a 22 gallon or 40 gallon drum. Those, those plastic, you, um, we have a 200, it's called 200 liter drum in South Africa. Oh, like the barrels they use for barrel racing? Is that what you mean? Yeah, a barrel that's yeah. made out of plastic. Uh -huh. like, so I, I don't like the steel ones because it sometimes they also bump oh, against it. Sure. And we don't want them to ones. hurt or bruise themselves. Plastic yeah. ones, they bump yeah. it and just it spins. Right. So, right. so if, you, if you can imagine that you put a, 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 a 200 liter drum, 200 liter drum with a, a meter gap in between and you train the horse goes through the gap. Every time they cross this line, we go tsk, mark that desired response, turn, come and fetch your reward. So you can use any, any obstacle, but the intention is to have a gap. And then okay. in time, when they know that they're going to get rewarded, they start going to the gap by themselves because they know they get rewarded here. And then we put a, a car tire there, flat on the ground, 
and they start popping over that and eventually we put a second car tire and they pop over that and eventually we put a third car tire and now the tires are level with the, the drums and oh. the horse is learning. So that's how I train horses for eventing to jump skinnies because once they know that they must jump the tires, yeah, then you start moving the drums away in 10 centimeter increments, but they keep jumping the tires because they know they get rewarded for doing that. And then slowly, slowly you start moving the tires away. Love that. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so you are next level. You're gonna go you're gonna go and do this thing now. Perhaps we'll see. <laughs> no, 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 don't don't the, so Master Yoda have, says there still, is no I'm still time. on the fence about um cross country with pepper. Like I like the idea of just jumping in the <laughs> arena. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. But if I was training, no, you don't, people, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't you don't have to go cross country. It's, it's no, such no. a nice thing to to train. That's uh, true. To just, just to a, have that that you know that would help with straightness. I'm gonna do that. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. Now we're talking. <laughs> now yeah, I'm so, thinking so the, why it would help. <laughs> My brain's going back online again. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. It takes a moment. Um, I have two more questions from my clients that I just realized You're I forgot. Welcome. Sorry. Um, so I've got Kelly wanted to know: Can you recommend some beginning exercises for a horse that's new to dressage? Ooh, Kelly, good quality questions, get good quality answers with the voice of Morgan Freeman. <laughs> so what's really important, and I'm going to go fast, is like because I, you can always rewind it and watch it again. So if I can uh, uh, suggest, Kelly, that you make notes uh, as, you, as I explain, you can always go back to the notes because uh, there's quite a few really cool things that you're going to do. You definitely want to help your horse to find neutral feet in the middle of our invisible box. So right in the beginning, I was talking about my neutral mat. So that to me is really, really important that the horse knows how to stand still in the middle of the invisible box that your bit, your reins and your legs create from a bird's eye view. And the mat is such a nice exercise because you're standing in front of the horse, you're holding onto, and I prefer a rope halter because um, uh, the halt is self-centering. So if you hold the fiat door knot under their the jaw here, it's like a joystick almost. So if the horse is in the middle of the mat with their feet, they will be in the middle of the invisible box around their head because the halt that fundamentally creates this invisible box. Obviously, if they pull back, there will be pressure on the back of the head. If they walk forward into you, there will be pressure on the, the bridge of their nose. So there's already a parameter behind, a parameter in front. If they step to this side, there'll be pressure here. The one knot's gonna touch them on the side of their face, which is ultimately gonna bring them back to the middle. Every time they come back to the middle, we wanna mark and motivate. So we go tsk for a desired response and give the horse. Do you call it a pony nut or a pellet? It's called a treat. <laughs> a treat, then you give your horse every time. So every time your horse tries to touch the mat with either foot initially. So as, as reward the smallest tries, it's the biggest favor you can do your horse. And then when they put one foot on consistently, then it's not difficult to get the second foot on, but you really want to help them to find neutral in the middle of that invisible box. So if their feet in the, uh, on both feet on the mat, fundamentally the head is in the middle of the halt. And that really transferred to under saddle when we start putting a bit in their mouth, reins on the either side, legs behind, and the horses at least go understand so we've trained the answer before we actually ask the question. Otherwise, we get on a young dressage horse and we expect them to stand still and they, they're feeling claustrophobic and they're pushing on the box and we keep telling them no, 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 no. And, and we increase their cortisol levels and we actually develop anticipating anxiety. So that to me is a big one. Then the next one. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, I'm agreeing. And I keep going. I'm like... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then the next one, we want to put the bridle on, noseband nice and loose so that you can put two fingers under the, uh, under the noseband like this. Yes. So definitely be able to do that. Otherwise, the horse cannot lick and chew properly. And so very important, take the flash off and use it to tie up firewood with. That's, you don't need, you don't need a flash <laughs> noseband, yeah. all this extra leather. <laughs> And then your canvas and nose band, you want to make the canvas and nose band so that you can fit two fingers. So, uh, and, and the purpose of a, a, a canvas and nose band is actually for to take beautiful pictures. So the rule of thirds from the brow band to the nose band is two thirds. 
and then from the noseband to the tip of the muzzle is another third. So it's for beautiful pictures. That's what a noseband is actually for. It's not to tie the horse's mouth shut, because if we tie the horse's mouth shut, we are actually creating what I call um, uh, artificially induced stress. So if horse is not able to lick and chew, and more importantly, um, not able to swallow, the horse cannot redirect the blood away from the muscles back to the intestine. So that is a big deal for me. Every time I train people, I ask them permission. I'm always very polite. Take the, can I, do you mind if I take the flash noseband off because we want to feed your horse? And they go, no, no problem. And then I normally throw it somewhere in the grass. And then they, they can't find it. And then they phone me afterwards and go, where did you put my nose band? I go, oh, I'm sorry. It, it's in the grass next to the arena somewhere. I often suggest <laughs> no. to put it on the front of the saddle as like a, a, an uh oh grip, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good purpose. Like multi-purpose nose band. We like that. That's a good purpose for it. Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. Uh, you can tie your boots up with it as well. Works really well for that as well. And then, so, so once you have that, then you want to stand in front of your horse. You want to hook your thumbs into the snaffle ring and then use your index finger and your middle finger and, and basically squeeze the bit up towards the ears as if you're squeezing a syringe on either side to the ears to encourage a jaw release. And, and so when you get that licking and chewing, the moment you get licking and chewing, you want to mark and motivate your horse with food. So what we're actually doing is, unlike Pavlov that rang the bell and then gave the dog a piece of meat, we're using a tactile trigger in your horse's mouth corners to get the licking and chewing going. But more importantly, it's the food that uh, uh, that uh, goes to the intestines that's telling the brain food's coming. And then the autonomic nervous system says, if there's food coming, the blood cannot be in the muscles and in the intestines at the same time. So it redirects the blood back to the intestines. So that's a biggie, another biggie. And then the next level up is to train the horse to stretch forward and down. So, um, and so fundamentally, it's still the same cue. So we're still both thumbs standing in front of your horse, facing your horse, thumbs into the saffle ring on either side, hold the nose band on either side, squeeze. And now when your horse starts licking and chewing, you're not going to click and reward or mark and motivate. You're going to release this feedback. Well done for doing that. And then you can you imagine that your belt buckle, you guys have got very cool belt buckles in, in America. Get yourself a really nice colorful belt buckle. And then um, you get your horse to come and touch your belt buckle with their muzzles. So we train them to uncontract their back muscles and stretch forward and down. So if you have a horse that is calm and relaxed in their brain and their back muscles are uncontracted, it is that much easier then to try and train them to contract their stomach muscles to put their hind feet more forward and under the deepest part of the saddle where the rider's weight is. And if you think of going to the gym and weightlifting, if we are holding, if someone is pushing my neck down like this while I'm trying to lift weights, it's going to be impossible. So if someone is holding the horse's mouth and the pole is lower than the third neck vertebra, the horse cannot lift their torso and the rider's weight up. So you want to allow the horse to uncontract their back and then you want to get their stomach muscles to contract because the, the muscles always work in pairs. So unless the top line is uncontracted, the stomach muscles cannot bring those hind feet forward and under the deepest part of the saddle. So a, a simple picture, it's not absolutely correct, but a simple picture to have in your mind. So you want the horse's left hind foot under your left seat bone if you're sitting in the saddle and your horse's right hind foot under your right seat bone because that's when they can start lifting you up. If we do Levard or Passard, for instance, if you want to do the, the higher school movements, but that's only possible if the horse's hind feet is here. If the horse's hind feet are here, back out the back door or even under the horse, and you'll see this at competitive level, Grand Prix level dressage, even at Olympic level, that a lot of the horses will bring their front feet further and further back until their front feet is actually under the girth. So that horse is actually still putting weight on their front feet. They're not putting the weight on their hind feet. And the reason why is because they contracted in their back. And the reason why they contracted in their back is because they're unable to lick and chew because they cannot access the parasympathetic state of the autonomic nervous system. So we are artificially inducing stress. And then because we put a double bridle in their mouth, we can physically control them because we're holding them in this invisible box. So it's, so it's a big thing to be able to say, hey, I don't have to hold you in the invisible box. I can just calm your nervous system down and then it all starts relaxing. And then we get some really nice piafs and massages 
because the horse is doing it from a place of relaxation and, and then it's much more expressive yeah <laughs> than a horse that is doing it from a place where the muscles are opposing each other and it looks very mechanical like this and i don't know about you but if i want to go have fun dancing if my mouth is tied it's not going to be pleasant <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, mm, mm. it sticks yeah. to your mouth and we use insulation tape around your head. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would think of it that way. Like, how would that feel to me? <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, I love that I, explanation. I, Thank you so much for that. And I think my every, pleasure. If, if I, I every, hope I didn't offend if, anyone. If every horse person <laughs> could actually hear that and take it in, this would be a whole new world, I tell you. Um, ah, but yeah. fortunately, there's like-minded people, and, and slowly but surely, it's like the Trojan horse. Yeah, we are training or changing this this whole industry from the inside out. Is it because there's people that are starting to say, "Been there, done that, got the T-shirt, don't yep. want to ever do that again." So for exactly. every one finger that's pointing away from me, there's three fingers yeah. pointing back. Yeah, I, I was like that too things. until I realized how bad it was, and I'm like, "Oh, I don't want to do that again." <laughs> so, exactly. Yeah, ah, and the nice thing is. We are, we are willing to try something, fail at it, learn from it, improve on it, repeat. And we keep, and like I said earlier on, because of social media and the internet, we, we have, we, 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 we try, fail, learn quite fast. Like Elon Musk, he, he's literally bl bl blowing up a rocket a week, but every time they learn something from it and they're improving, they don't just keep blowing the rockets up. They're actually starting to now do it like once every two months, which is amazing. Actually, it's happening less and less and less, which is really cool. We like it like that. We don't like it when he blows up the rocket. We don't like breaking horses. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, so Carrie wanted to know if you have any tips for maintaining, maintaining cadence slash rhythm through circles and serpentines or serpentines, however you say. Okay. <laughs> so a, a cadence is another thing. And, and this comes just to, to, to explain how everything fits. Definitely the stuff that I explained in terms of, first of all, we relax the horse and autonomic nervous system, undo the nose band, get the blood away from the muscles, back to the intestine, get the horse eating and mark and motivate the desired response. And then start contracting the stomach muscles, which rotates the pelvis, gets the hind feet more forward and under the deepest part of the saddle, lifts the rider up. So that already, if you think of in terms of weightlifting, we start using our glutes the big muscles in our hindquarters to lift the weight rather than the small muscles in the neck. So um, I'm sure you've seen this in the gym when, when people do this. They yank their neck up and then they lift the weight up. That's very bad for your lower back. So you see horses going into a canter. They, they, they flick their neck like this and people try and hold them down. So we're trying to avoid it. We, we want to train the horse in the walk to engage their inside hind foot on a circle. So shoulder in on a circle, helps the horse to put the one foot, it's like learning to juggle, we just do one side, so we train, put your right hind foot forward and under the deepest part of the saddle where my weight is. And when that's working really well, obviously we wanna do the same on the left because normally horses are, we call it one side, it is like all um, back, uh, asymmetric, asymmetrical I think is the word. And so we obviously, the left foot, Someone used this analogy. They said, like if the, uh, imagine you're standing with your right foot on a skateboard and you're pushing with your left foot. That, that, that's, that's a horse for you. It's like they, they can do that really well. But now switch and you put your left foot on the skateboard and you try and push with your right foot. It feels weird and you're going to wobble. Or even just so. trying to get on the opposite side. I, 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 <laughs> I'm like, I can't put my foot in. I'm just going to put my leg over. I just, it's too weird. <laughs> It does feel strange, eh? Or you get on and then you realize, my horse doesn't have a head. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, definitely to the, um, get the hind foot under the deepest part of the saddle, but train one half, then train the other half. Because that is what really helps the horse to lift their torso. And when their torso is more up, the base of the neck is more up. And then that's where the cadence comes from. When the horse's weight is supported by their back feet, being more back legs, being more forward and under, instead of trying to hold them down in their neck and, and their back legs, when their back muscles and their lower back are, are contracted, you can literally see 
the stride length is different. So the, the amazing thing nowadays with our really nice phones is you can video something and then you can pause it and then you can scroll very slowly on your phone and yeah. you can see the difference. So I video people a lot and then I will say to them, uh, you're holding the horse too much in front and they go, no. And then I go, okay, I'm in a video. So I normally have already got proof. I go watch this. I go, okay, now release the horse a little bit in its mouth, pick up its pole a little bit. So we, we asked the horse to come a bit more up rather than riding the horse behind the vertical with the pole lower than the third neck vertebra. We actually lift them up a little bit. So they are a little bit more open. And then we do exactly the same thing. And suddenly that hind leg is coming that little bit more forward and under. It might just be, let's say for argument's sake, to keep it simple. The side length is a meter. If you get yours to relax their back a little bit more and you can increase it by 5%, the horse is now going one meter and five centimeters more forward and under. And suddenly the, the horse starts feeling a little bit lighter. People go, that's amazing. And I go, yeah, all you have to do is let go a little bit. And so that's really the intention. Let go. Is to that's do the it. key. Let go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, because we we want to we want to control everything. <laughs> yeah. That's one of my biggest lessons. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has been awesome. I have one last question for you, Yinku. You are welcome. <laughs> I I have time. I'm in okay. in the most beautiful city <laughs> in the world called Cape Town, and. Uh, I have flown in especially to do this podcast from Durban. I almost got, uh, didn't get here because they, uh, uh, British Airways is, is, I don't know, they have something happening. It's like uh, they're striking or something. And so uh, I was the second last plane to leave or, wow. or left on the second last plane out of Durban. And I flew to Cape Town and the sun sets here at half past seven in the evening. So you can go all day if you want. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see. Um, okay, so you know the billboards you see as you're driving along, and there's a like a one big expression there. What would you write on your billboard if everyone in the horse world could see it? Together we can improve the future for horse and human. Beautiful. I go into Canva and I create it and then you'll have your own image with your billboard. <laughs> that would be so cool. I'm one of those people that like the flashy things like Las Vegas. Eh? So if you can go and Canva, oh, I'll try to make that would sparkly. be amazing. <laughs> yeah, we wanted like lots of, lots of lights, Vegas. People okay. need to notice it. <laughs> you got it. Yours will, be, yours will be extra special. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in Canva, because I've seen, I have not used Canva myself, but I see people doing some amazing things in Canva. So yeah, go for it. Thank you. Yes, I've, I've actually been really fortunate to learn it and everything I do, I just jump in and then I do tutorials as much as possible. I actually created my journal on Canva, believe it or not. Unbelievable. Thank you, because I actually have your journal You're and you welcome. sent it to me specially <laughs> with... Like I had it print on, printed on demand, it was mind blowing. And then it arrived here with a courier and I didn't expect them. It's like, so this guy is standing outside our gate, pressing his hooter and I'm like looking through the window and he's like, I've got a parcel for you. I go, what? And he's like, it's from America. I go, what? That's amazing. And I think it took three weeks from, from, from when we spoke about it to when it arrived. Right? Isn't that awesome? I'll show everybody. If you haven't seen it yet, this is a physical journal. Ah, yeah. Ooh, Believe in your ooh. magic. And actually, I'm getting ready to create um, the next version because my dear friend Carrie has created coloring pages with gorgeous horses and a lot of the inspired riding sayings. So I'd like to add that in there for people to like meditate and color in, in the back of the journal. I think that would be really fun, don't you think? That's special, eh? <laughs> yeah. My mom is big into coloring as well. It's like she loves oh, cool. it. Yeah. She spends like hours and days coloring in a picture. I love it. So, is oh, there anything nice. that you wanted to say that I didn't ask you? Ooh, we could talk for days on end. <laughs> yeah, Do you oh, really I... want to ask me this question? <laughs> <laughs> 
I have no, you know what, Beth, I, I think um, it's really nice that, that people are asking questions and I, and, and I really appreciate this, like you, um, that there's, there's uh, like a whole bunch of people um, asking questions from very different directions, but in the end, and, and I think this is something that is coming through in our conversation a lot, it's very interesting to see, even though we might use different ways to describe it, that in its essence, we are talking about the same thing, that there's this universal consciousness and that we are all able through your strings of light, uh, that we're able to tap into this universal consciousness. And yes, we obviously spend lots of time thinking, dreaming. It's all I do. I don't think anything else but horses. Um, but yeah, that other people also have access, that it's not um, just some uh, like a special gift that only you or I have it that other people can actually also access it and I think that's something that um, I really want to encourage people um, to to believe in your own I can yes I always say believe in your magic and know that you are powerful your horse believes in oh. you and, and so do I Oh, yeah. Oh, that's so nice. That's <laughs> deep. That's like King Arthur. Mm. <laughs> but yes, and that that's the one thing that I just have to always remind people of. You are powerful. Don't let yourself become a victim. You can make changes happen. You know, of all the things that happened to me in my life, I could have just stayed wallowing in self-pity, but that that is not in my nature. I'm like a cork in the ocean. I just keep popping back up. So <laughs> <laughs> Quite literally, hey. <laughs> Yo. yeah, I know you are resilient, that is for sure. Thank you. But I, I so appreciate everything that you have shared. You're always so generous with your information. And, and I really enjoyed the clarity in this conversation. And I, I want to applaud you because I know it has shifted for you as well. And I, I'm so impressed with how you're explaining things now. I very much appreciate it. But you are a very big source of inspiration. I often think of when I'm sitting there for 12 to 16 hours in front of my computer, how you've made the meditations to say, and, and oh, it's hard work, it takes lots of effort. And, and I'm sure people can see it. It's like, this is not something that you just quickly throw out there. You really um, drill down and there's so much attention to detail. It's really beautiful and very special. So you are a big source of inspiration. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. That's awesome to hear. I really appreciate it. And, um, <laughs> I look forward to when the weather gets better and then perhaps we can go back to some remote lessons with little Pepper and I because we sure love them. So <laughs> yeah. I would very much like that. Yeah. So I'm I'm holding thumbs for you for good weather, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was so nice. And then we had this crazy windstorm and, and snow flurry <laughs> south of Atlanta, Georgia. Like, what's that about? So I don't know. <laughs> the world is changing. <laughs> but I'm a very, very grateful that we're all here together. And um, thank you again, Yinko, for being here with us. And um, my absolute pleasure, my mm -hmm. absolute, absolute pleasure. Eh? Thank you. And I just want to remind everyone if you want to get a hold of Yinko, oh, which website should they go to? So it's, it's, it's under construction. Okay. But I'm, I'll, I'll let you know. I think what we'll need to do is we, maybe we do another podcast, is like when we're when ready, ready to launch. It's like so, it's it. yinko.tv. Okay. But, um, I'm working very hard on trying to get it out. And I know the pressure's on. I actually was trying very hard to have it ready so that we could um, say, hey, we've got it. This is, this is it. But the animations, learning to animate is taking a lot of time. And That's so, impressive uh, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so soon, soon. I was like, but cool. yeah, I was really pushing hard to have it ready for, for this podcast. But um, unfortunately, I didn't quite make it. So uh, hopefully in another month or two, I think like we'll be able to say, yay. Yes. Well, when, it is, when it's ready, you let me know. We'll have a launch party in the group for you. So. Oh, <laughs> that's going to be amazing. Thank you so yes. much, Beth. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. We're going to well, have candles as well. Hey, of a course. cake and candles. Maybe the and are we allowed? The are we allowed to? <laughs> are we allowed to pop champagne? <laughs> Why not? Why not? <laughs> I like you. <laughs> we are going to have an online party. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate you, you um, asking me. Thank you so much, eh? and thank you to everyone that is listening and watching. If you're living in America, you already have the I can gene because it says Ameri 
I can. Oh, I love that. I never even thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> and that's cool. You guys are in South Africa. We also have the I can gene because it says South Africa, I can. There you go. So we are like this. We are like yeah. twins. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Beth. I really appreciate this opportunity. Hey? Thank you so much. I appreciate you as well. And remember everyone to lead with kindness for yourself and for your horse. And may the horse be with you always. May the horse be with you always. <laughs>